Okay, I heard you. Video on whale evolution. Let's do it. The transition of whales from land to sea is one of the best documented examples of macroevolution in the fossil record. The first cetaceans lived about 50 million years ago and resembled wolves with hooves. Over time, their hooves evolved into flippers. Their nostrils became their blowholes and their bodies streamlined until they became extremely specialized for life in the ocean. But they're not alone. Land mammals returned to the ocean at least seven separate times. Two of these lineages went extinct, but five of them still exist today. Cyrenians, cetaceans, pinnipeds, sea otters, and polar bears. Together, these five clades are collectively known as marine mammals. Since they're mammals, they have several things in common. They're warm-blooded, produce milk for their young, they have a broad neocortex region of the brain, three middle ear bones, and fur, or hair. Yes, whales and dolphins have hair. The bumps on the face of a humpback whale are tubercles, and each has one or two tiny hair follicles. The other thing that connects marine mammals is that they all depend on ocean ecosystems for food and survival. But how and why did their terrestrial ancestors go back into the sea after millions of years on land? I'm KP, a marine biologist who specializes in marine mammals. The primary factors driving evolution and speciation have always been changes to climate and the environment. If an animal is adapted to a specific climate and environment and the climate and environment change, the animal won't survive. Unless, of course, an individual animal has a trait that is advantageous for the new climate. Then that individual might survive and reproduce, passing on that advantageous trait leading to the evolution of a species. Let's start with Cyrenians, which are manatees and dugongs because they're the oldest marine mammals. They diverged from early elephants about 60 million years ago, shortly after the latest Danian event that caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. At first glance, it might seem weird to think manatees and elephants share a common ancestor, but they are one of the least controversial clades of mammals backed by strong genetic and morphological evidence. For example, have you ever seen a manatee flipper next to an elephant's foot? One of the first Cyrenians was Pezosiren, the walking manatee. Even though it had four limbs and could walk on land, their fossils are found exclusively in marine rocks. Their heavy ribs strongly resemble modern manatees and dugongs, and this weight acted like a ballast to hold them down while in the water. We can also look at the chemical composition of their teeth for more clues. Oxygen in the molecules that make up teeth come from the water we drink and the food we eat. A study of these isotopes show that Pezosiren almost exclusively fed on seagrass. Over time, Cyrenian hind limbs got smaller and smaller until the point where they were fully aquatic. Even though Cyrenians no longer have hind legs, they still have a pelvic bone. This is what's known as a vestigial structure, which is something that has been retained during the evolutionary process, even though its function has been lost. Their toenails are another vestigial structure. I would argue toenails in humans, also a vestigial structure. What are you using them for? Name one thing you use your toenails for. I think they're for protection. From what? what if, dropping things on How have toes. you, from dropping things on your toes? Yeah. Uh, for a second, I thought you were suggesting that you fight people off with your toes. <laughs> okay. Examples of vestigiality in humans are things like wisdom teeth, tailbones, goosebumps, and even the hiccups, which are a vestigial remnant of breathing through gills. Like Cyrenians, whales and dolphins also have vestigial hind limbs. In fact, dolphin fetuses have hind limbs during their early development, but they regress and disappear before birth. Although there are cases where dolphins develop hind flippers and it's really kind of gross and I don't like it. Dolphin fetuses also have whiskers. Cetaceans first appeared shortly after Cyrenians, about 55 million years ago during the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. During this time, global average temperatures spiked and massive amounts of carbon were dumped into the ocean and atmosphere. The climate became soggy with increasing evaporation rates leading to torrential rainfall. Rising temperatures also led to a complete loss of sea ice. In some places, sea levels rose by 20 to 50 meters, or 60 to 160 feet. A lot of animals weren't cut out for this new hot and rainy environment, but it was perfect for a deer-like animal about the size of a cat 
called endohyus. The oxygen isotopic composition of their teeth tell us that endohyus was habitually aquatic. This is supported by the structure of their bones. Take a look at the cross-section of an endohyus femur. In most mammals, bone makes up about 40% of the total thickness, while the marrow cavity makes up more than 60%. It's the opposite in endohyus. This makes their bones very heavy, and heavy bones make it a struggle to run on land. So endohyus appears to have been similar to the fanged deer who dive into the water and hide beneath the surface when threatened. But endohyus is not the first cetacean. Instead, it is the missing link between whales and their terrestrial ancestors. The term missing link is pretty misleading, and honestly, I shouldn't use it because a lot of missing links aren't actually missing. A more scientific term is transitional fossil, which is an animal that has traits common to both the ancestral group and its descendants. One of these traits that Indohyus shares with modern whales is the structure of the middle ear. In mammals, the walls of our middle ear are made of a bone called the ectotympanic. The thickness of the ectotympanic is consistent all around the ear in most mammals, except cetaceans. In cetaceans, and only in cetaceans, the internal wall is significantly thicker than the external wall. This is called the involucrum and is used for directional hearing underwater. Again, the only mammals with an involucrum are endohyus and cetaceans, including the first cetacean, the star of our show, Pachycetus. Pachycetus first appeared about 5 million years after endohyus and looked less like a whale and more like a wolf. It was about one to two meters in length or three and a half to six and a half feet. It had four legs, hooves, and its nose was on the tip of a very long snout. But Pachycetus had unique adaptations that make it clear it was the ancestor of modern whales. One is the involucrum. Another is the formation of its teeth. In humans and most mammals, the incisors arc across the front of our jaws and form almost a right angle with the premolars and the molars. In toothed whales, the incisors are on the same line as premolars and molars, which is what we see in Pachycetus. We also see large polished areas on their enamel that is pretty unusual unless the animal has a diet primarily consisting of fish. Like Indohyus, Pachycetus had heavy bones, suggesting it lived in an aquatic habitat, most likely shallow streams that periodically flooded from torrential rains, which is where the fossils have been found. Its eyes were also closer to the top of its skull, which is common in aquatic animals like hippos, who can be almost totally submerged but still look at things above the water. Also like hippos, Pachycetus had a distinct ankle bone found in animals like cows, giraffes, and bison. In my opinion, this is one of the wilder facts about whales and dolphins. Even though they are all carnivores, they're not in the carnivora order. They're in the arteriodactyl order, which are even-toed ungulates. Modern whales even have multi-chambered stomachs like hippos and other ungulates. And while Pachycetus is often depicted as having fur, their relatively close ancestry with hippos suggests their hair or fur might have been pretty sparse. Roughly a million years after Pachycetus first ventured into shallow streams, ancient whales moved into bays and estuaries. This is where we find Ambulocetus, which first appeared about 49 million years ago. Ambulocetus was larger than Pachycetus, about 3 meters or 10 feet long, and it weighed about 300 kilograms or 660 pounds, roughly the size of a modern sea lion. It had a strong tail and short, powerful limbs. The proportions of the thighs, feet, and paws are similar to those of river otters. Because of this, it's believed Ambulocetus swam like river otters using their hind limbs and tail for propulsion. It's a 660 pound river otter. While the evidence suggests Ambulocetus was more aquatic than Pachycetus, it still had really heavy bones, so it probably wasn't a fast swimmer. More likely, it was an ambush predator, similar to crocodiles crocodile otter of terror. From 49 million years ago to about 40 million years ago, cetaceans underwent at least two major adaptations. The first is the position of their eyes. Their eyes now face laterally, similar to modern cetaceans. The other major change was the position of their nasal opening. It moved further back on the snout, more like a blowhole. These whales are known as protocetids. 
but they still hadn't become fully aquatic. About 20 years ago, in the early 2000s, a groundbreaking fossil was discovered in an Eocene formation in Pakistan. The fossil was that of an adult female protoceded and her near-term fetus. What was remarkable about this discovery is that the fetus was positioned head first. Now, modern whales are born tail first, and the reason is to prevent drowning. Being born tail first ensures that the calf's blowhole is the last part of the body to emerge, giving it more time to surface for its first breath. The position of this fossilized fetus is evidence that protoceded still had to come onto land to give birth and nurse their young, similar to modern day sea lions. This was a really cool discovery and I've linked it in all of my sources down in the descriptions below if you're interested in reading more. The first fully aquatic cetaceans were the Bacillosauridae, which was a family of multiple species that ranged in size from 4 to 16 meters or 13 to 52 feet. Their nasal opening had shifted even higher up on the snout, back towards the eyes, and closer to the position of the blowhole in modern cetaceans. Their forearms had evolved into flippers. Like Sirenians, their hind limbs had shrunk to the point that they could no longer support their weight on land, and their pelvis lacked any bony connections to the vertebral column. This is something called convergent evolution, which is the process where unrelated organisms evolve similar traits or features as a result of adapting to similar environments. Another example of convergent evolution is their tail flukes. Dugongs and whales are not closely related, yet they both independently evolved very similar flukes. In modern cetaceans, the vertebrae in the body are taller than they are wide, and in the tail, they are wider than they are tall. We see this same pattern in Bacillosaurids, suggesting they were the first cetaceans to have flukes. Although, they were likely pretty small. These flukes, along with the high degree of flexibility in the vertebral column, indicate Bacillosaurus likely swam by undulating up and down. Bacillosaurids lived between 40 and 33 million years ago, from the Middle Eocene up to the Eocene-Oligocene extinction event, also known as Le Grand Coupeur, or Great Cut. According to leading models, this extinction event was triggered by major geological changes, such as the opening of the Drake Passage and the creation of the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. These changes triggered an enormous climate shift and dramatic global cooling, leading to the formation of Antarctic glaciers and the expansion of the Antarctic ice sheets. Bacillosaurids were forced to adapt and diverged into two sister clades that would become modern whales, specifically toothed whales, known as Odontoceti, and baleen whales, known as Mysticeti. Both clades went through extraordinary transitions in ecology, physiology, and anatomy. The most important in toothed whales was the development of a biosonar known as echolocation. Echolocation opened up a broad range of new aquatic habitats and food sources, allowing toothed whales to become the most diverse marine mammal lineage with approximately 79 extant species from tiny harbor porpoises to massive sperm whales and the ever popular killer whale. The skulls of early Mysticeti don't show any sign of echolocation abilities. Instead, they adapted to this new world by acquiring a novel feeding mechanism. The formation of the Antarctic circumpolar current triggered an explosion of ocean productivity and an abundance of smaller prey. Mysticeti took advantage of this abundance and began filter feeding in bulk. Early Mysticeti still had teeth, but they were lobed, similar to the teeth of modern day crab eater seals. Despite this name, crab eater seals do not eat crab. They eat krill by swimming into swarms with their mouths open. Then they close their mouths and push the water through their unique lobed teeth like a sieve, allowing them to filter krill from seawater, just like modern baleen whales. Probably not quite as well, but maybe one day. Speaking of seals, it was around this same time in the middle Oligocene, after the Drake Passage opened, that pinnipeds first appeared. The evolution of seals, sea lions, and walruses isn't nearly as well documented or understood as the evolution of cetaceans, and there is a lot of debate and disagreement. For a long time, it was believed that seals descended from the Mustelid or weasel family. While sea lions and walruses descended from bears, perhaps something similar to Colpanomo, also known as the oyster bear, also known as a good boy. Oh, he's just a little guy. In 2008, paleontologists discovered a transitional fossil of pinnipeds, an aquatic animal with a long tail, dog-like teeth, 
and webbed feet. It looked and probably behaved much like a river otter, with a body adapted for swimming even though it spent most of its time on land. This is Puhia, and its discovery gave rise to the argument that all pinnipeds descended from mustelids and not bears. The current belief is that the oldest known pinniped is Inaliarctos, and it might represent the ancestor to all pinnipeds. Marine mammals thrived in this period. Mysticeti replaced their teeth with baleen plates and grew to become the largest animals ever seen on Earth. Toothed whales diversified. Pinnipeds diverged into the seals, sea lions, and walruses we know today. And the Earth saw another mammal return to the sea. Thalassinus, the only known giant sloth that was aquatic, the most terrifying animal to ever walk the ocean floor. Like Cyrenians and early cetaceans, Thalassinus had dense, heavy bones that acted like a ballast. And in another example of convergent evolution, their nostrils were farther up their head, like protocetids. These sloths likely walked along the sea floor like a nightmare and used their claws to dig up food. They didn't have any adaptations that would have helped them swim, so they were probably very slow in the water, making them easy prey for macro-predatory sperm whales like Leviathan, and even large sharks like Megalodon. Leviathan is an interesting whale. Its teeth are the largest biting teeth of any animal, measuring 36 centimeters or a little over a foot long, and it probably competed with Megalodon for food. Megalodon, Leviathan, and Thalassinus went extinct at the end of the Pliocene, along with a significant number of marine megafauna. This marine extinction event, which happened three to five million years ago, was caused by global cooling when the Central American Seaway closed and killed off most of the seagrass along the Pacific coast of South America. The extinction of Megalodon and Leviathan also coincides with the arrival of a new apex predator, killer whales who probably outcompeted them for food. It was also around this time that sea otters first transitioned from rivers to oceans. They are the smallest marine mammal and their evolution is pretty unique. They are the only marine mammals without a dense layer of blubber to keep them warm. Instead, they develop the densest fur of any animal with about a million hairs per square inch. They also keep warm through their incredibly high metabolism. Every sea otter will need to eat a quarter of their body weight every day. Even though sea otters are one of the youngest species of marine mammals, in some ways they're more adapted to marine environments than pinnipeds. While seals, sea lions, and walruses still have to come onto land to give birth and nurse their pups, sea otters do all of that in the water. This brings us to the most recent mammal to return to the sea. Roughly 400,000 years ago, polar bears quickly adapted to a polar environment with a thick coat of fur, a layer of blubber, large paws that act as snowshoes and swimming paddles, and teeth that are specialized for hunting seals. They are also strong swimmers, capable of swimming for days. If you want to learn more about polar bears, I did a really deep dive into all their amazing adaptations in a video that should have gotten a lot more views. One of polar bears' most significant adaptations was a genetic upgrade to their lipid metabolism and cardiovascular health allowing them to feast on a high-fat diet of seal blubber without clogging their arteries. Now, those of you who watch my videos probably know that I like to end them by talking about why this matters. Sure, prehistoric marine mammals are really cool. Who doesn't love extinct megafauna? But there are practical applications to this knowledge. The US Navy has spent decades researching the streamlined body shapes of dolphins and their echolocation to develop better ships and sonar. Studying the thermal regulation, longevity, cancer resistance, hypoxia tolerance, and lipid metabolism of marine mammals has led to breakthroughs in human healthcare. It's helped us better understand aging, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and stroke recovery. And understanding how marine mammal populations responded to climate change in the past can help us predict how marine ecosystems might respond to climate change today. Hopefully, before it's too late.